Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about circulatory system. This is one of the most important topics uh, because uh, almost all people with aging they suffer from hypertension. Uh, myocardial infarction is one of the most um, a common cause of death among adult people. So if even you are not going to work in cardiology or cardiosurgery, in any way your patients uh, with a very high probability will have this uh, diseases or some so you have to know how to deal with that um, so let's start first we have to understand that circulatory system is represented by the heart and vessels um, vessels they differ uh, by the diameter and by the direction of blood flow arteries they carry blood from the heart to tissues while veins in opposite direction from tissues to heart and we classify all vessels uh, into two broad categories blood vessels and lymphatic vessels as for the lymphatic vessels we have already discussed them in the topic um, lymphoid organs um, peripheral lymphoid organs together with the lymphatic nodes um, today we are to talk about blood vessels um, they are divided into arteries and veins um, but except them there are capillaries um, in which um, the blood uh, exchanges different substances between the tissues and blood and AV shunts. Um, later we'll discuss them. First, arteries are not homogeneous, they have different structure and depending on the diameter their wall has some um, different layers. That's why we distinguish large arteries. They are the most close to the heart and um, vessels located close to the heart arteries located close to heart are elastic. Then medium-sized arteries are called muscular because smooth muscle cells prevail in their structure and because these arteries with the help of smooth muscles they regulate the blood pressure. Exactly, they are the target of many drugs. Then small arteries and arterioles, um, they change their diameter and consequently they lead to the blood capillaries. There are four, uh, three types of blood capillaries. Also, we have lymphatic capillaries, um, and um, we are to discuss them later. And also, we have um, different types of veins. They differ by their diameter as well as by the structure of their um, wall. That's what you have to know about the classification of vessels. And uh, now, let's investigate them one by one. And let's start from arteries. And typically, we investigate the structure of the vessel wall uh, on the muscular artery because it has all the envelopes very well developed. <clears throat> so let's first investigate the medium-sized muscular artery and after that we'll investigate all the other vessels in comparison with them. So muscular arteries, um, they have the innermost envelope which is called tunica intima as well as almost all the vessels, yeah, all the vessels, they have tunica intima. Uh, we typically and traditionally uh, name these envelopes uh, in Latin, so do not, when you are asked uh, about the layers of the vessel's wall, you should say tunica intima, media and adventitia, because some students, they say there is the external, middle and internal membrane uh, envelopes, no, tunica intima, media and adventitia. Then, intima, it is represented by three components. First, and one of the most important, is the endothelium. It aligns vessels from the inside, and uh, this is the simple squamous epithelial tissue. Its structure and functions uh, will be discussed later. Then, under the epithelium, there is a thin layer of connective tissue, loose connective tissue with some elastic fibers um, and ground substance. And after that, on the border between the tunica intima and media, there is an internal elastic membrane. It is labeled um, by yellow color because you remember elastic fibers, they are yellow uh, and uh, when they are not stained. Um, this elastic membrane helps to maintain the diameter open. And in the histological specimen, as you have to distinguish all those components, uh, it is given elastic membrane uh, is uh, transparent and in muscular arteries it is wavy shaped. Um, uh, 
this is the typical appearance of muscular artery because after post-mortal contraction of smooth muscle cells, the intima turns into ruffled appearance. So this uh, waves um, are the sign of the muscular artery. In elastic artery, endothelium and tunica intima will be smooth. So remember that. Okay, so tunica intima and there are three components. That's what we have um, considered. Let's move on. And now as for the tunica media, the middle layer and in muscular arteries, as you can see, this is the thickest one and it is represented by many circular or circumferentially oriented smooth muscle cells. You may see those nuclei are longitudinal, means they are circular. And uh, exactly those cells are responsible for the blood pressure. So these arteries, they can regulate their diameter by relaxing or contracting smooth muscles. Um, and in this way, they help to maintain stable blood pressure. Blood pressure is very important uh, in the circulatory system, of course, because when it is low, then organs, they suffer from the deficiency of oxygen. When the pressure is elevated, also it might damage many organs. Then external elastic membrane. Here we can see again of yellow color, also perforated and uh, elastic membranes. They are on both sides located um, of the tunica medium. And in many arteries, uh, elastic membranes are absent, but if we are talking about muscular arteries, it is very well distinguishable. Notice this transparent wavy shaped line. This is exactly the external elastic membrane. Compare with the internal elastic membrane, internal is a little bit more prominent. Yeah. So the tunica intima here is represented by flattened endothelial cells, internal elastic membrane, and um, media by smooth muscle cells and external elastic membrane. Notice that specimen is stained uh, with hematoxylin and eosin, and um, that's why elastic fibers are transparent, because to visualize them we need to use or seen or some other dysum. Then, after the tunica media, the outermost, um, the tunica externa or adventitia, is located outside the vessel and uh, it is um, represented by loose connective tissue with vessels and nerves. Vessels are needed to nourish the thick vessel's wall. For example, if we are talking about aorta, its wall is too thick to be nourished from the lumen by diffusion. So even despite aorta carries oxygenated blood, it needs to be supplied from outside. That's why the outermost envelope of the large vessel also has its own blood vessel. They are called vasa vasorum. And of course, nervi vasorum. Nervi vasorum, they are important in regulating the diameter of the artery and blood pressure, and many other parameters. Um, okay, so tunica externa is not very well developed in arteries, it is much more developed in veins. So in this way, we have considered three envelopes um, of muscular arteries, medium-sized arteries um, and the typical components. Now let's compare muscular arteries with another arteries. Uh, as we have said, large arteries are also called elastic, medium-sized are called muscular and small arteries are small. Here diameters are given and uh, in this way we understand that Arteries, they start from the heart and arteries located close to the heart, they are of elastic type. Then with each next branch and moving far from the heart, they turn into muscular and after that muscular turn into small. So they change each other and they are consequently located along the blood flow. So what's the difference between the muscular and elastic arteries? The first difference uh, is in the tunica media. As you can see here in the media, elastic fibers, they prevail. And in large elastic arteries, we can't find smooth muscle cells. Instead of smooth muscle cells, here we have elastic fibers. And elastic fibers, they form membranes 
with many perforations inside them, up to 60 membranes uh, there could be found, as you can see here, membranes are very well distinguishable one from another. They are circularly oriented and the most important function of those membranes is to prevent tearing of the vessel during the contraction of the heart and to prevent collapsing during the diastole. So when blood is pumped from ventricles to the aorta or pulmonary trunk, they are stretched a little bit and in this way they are not torn. And when um, um, during the diastole, the opposite is true. It returns to the initial diameter but doesn't collapse. So elasticity is a rubber-like uh, property which um, helps to maintain the, lupin, the lumen of the vessel always opened. That's why large arteries should have elastic arteries to resist differences uh, in the pressure. When arteries change their diameter, the pressure decreases. Um, that's why they need smooth muscle elements um, to maintain the blood pressure stable. Also muscular arteries are called distributary arteries because they distribute blood between different organs and sometimes uh, one organ needs more blood than another one. And that's what we can regulate by regulating the contraction of smooth muscle elements. Uh, then, um, yeah, that's why you can see that in uh, the tunica media of muscular arteries we can see internal elastic membrane and external elastic membrane. Only two of them, and between them smooth muscle elements. While in elastic arteries, lots of membranes, but no smooth muscle cells. As for the tunica adventitia, it is also very well developed in aorta, but media is more thick in both elastic, muscular and even small arteries. In any way, tunica media is the most prominent in arteries if we compare with adventitia. Okay, small arteries, um, they have um, all the envelopes, um, but uh, outer elastic membrane is absent and internal elastic membrane is very poor developed. Um, and after small arteries, um, we have arterioles. Arterioles are less than 0.1 millimeter in diameter and arterioles, they do not have both external and internal elastic membrane and uh, the adventitia is very poorly developed. So only one or two layers of smooth muscle cells. And arterioles, they are the last component before capillaries. Um, okay, let's now go to veins uh, and compare. First of all, we have to understand the differences between arteries and veins. So veins, um, first of all, uh, there are no elastic membranes. Um, if to be exact, uh, internal elastic membrane could be found in medium-sized veins, uh, but it is discontinuous and very, very poorly developed, uh, so almost absent. Then, presence of walls. Um, really, they are present to prevent the backflow of the heart, of the blood, because um, especially in lower limbs, um, uh, due to the position of our body, blood is uh, mo blood moves against the gravitation, and to prevent the backflow, walls are needed. Yeah, to provide the unidirectional flow. Then, tunica external thicker than medium. I've repeated just many times, yeah, that in arteries, media is the thickest. In veins, adventitia is the thickest, is the most prominent. And besides, the question is why? How do you think why in veins the tunica adventitia is much more thick than in arteries? If you know the answer, just put in the comments below. Then, collagen fibers prevail over elastic. In arteries, really, we have more elastic than collagen fibers uh, in, in their wall, and they, uh, they really have those rubber-like properties. Well, in veins, we have more collagen than elastic. And uh, irregular shape of the lumen. If we compare with the artery, the lumen is always opened. Uh, that's, again, due to elasticity. In veins, elastic fibers are almost absent. They are present, but in a low amount. And uh, the lumen gets coiled, um, collapses uh, when we prepare the specimen. That's how we can easily distinguish veins from arteries, by the shape of the lumen, first of all. Okay, and also notice that in arteries, here is the tunica media, 
compare with the thickness of adventitia media is thicker and if you look at the vein notice that medium is more lightly stained here it is while adventitia is of red color due to high content of collagen fibers and smooth muscle elements so adventitia is much more thick this is the most thick envelope in veins then veins also are classified into large medium small then also we have um, postcapillary small venules uh, venules and postcapillary venules um, uh, first let's talk about large medium and small they are located close to the heart um, then to the peripheral organs here yeah, if we move uh, we have medium and then small veins in the large veins um, they have very well prominent all three envelopes um, and um, let's pay attention to the tunica adventitia as it has longitudinal bundles of smooth muscle cells that's unusual because in arteries uh, usually we have smooth muscles only in the tunica media and usually they are of circular orientation notice that in the tunica adventitia of large veins there are bundles of longitudinal smooth muscle cells and they're very prominent really also tunica adventitia of large veins like vena cava and pulmonary trunk they might have myocardial sleeves these are extensions of myocardial of atrial myocardium and uh, due to abnormal contraction of those cells some um, atrial fibrillation fibrillation could be observed in patient so those myocardial sleeves um, often cause abnormalities of atrial contraction and uh, that's uh, what we have to remember so it's very interesting that in adventition not only its own smooth muscle cells could be found but sometimes even cardiomyocytes actually the other part of the heart but sometimes they extend uh, to the large vessels um, okay as for the medium-sized veins uh, they um, have um, uh, circular smooth muscles in the tunica media also in the tunica adventitia some longitudinal muscles could be found but they do not form bundles uh, they are not as prominent in the large vein and uh, adventitia in all three types are more developed uh, is more developed than medium okay uh, then in the small sized veins uh, we can see that media it has only several layers of smooth muscle cells um, and adventitia is almost um, very very thin then as for them yeah besides here in this specimen we can see in large version compare the media and adventitia you can see that adventitia is much more developed and the wolf is uh, shown with an arrow and again in the diagram the comparison is given notice that yellow elastic membranes are almost absent in veins uh, compare the thickness of the tunica media in arteries much more thick and the thickness of adventitia which is more developed in veins walls are present okay so this is the visual comparison maybe more easy to remember for you and if we look at the specimen notice that usually artery and vein they accompany each other and uh, artery will be um, smaller in diameter than respective vein but the thickness of the wall will be greater so thickness is more is uh, high in arteries while the diameter is in vein and notice also that the um, diameter the lumen is oval rounded while it is irregular in vein Okay, and uh, after we have discussed veins, um, besides uh, several words, uh, should be said that uh, in postcapillary venules, uh, postcapillary venules, uh, they contain almost nothing except endothelium and pericytes, um, and they are the site of action of such uh, substances you already know, that, like histamine, uh, and uh, histamine causes them. Uh, increased permeability of postcapillary venules uh, and they cause edema so the site of action is exactly postcapillary venules that's why they are considered as a distinct part of vessels um, and um, they have almost no smooth muscle elements uh, only pericytes pericytes uh, are almost the same as mesenchymal stromal cells 
and they can give rise to smooth muscle elements, fibroblasts uh, in adipose cells. Um, and uh, they are prospective source for the regenerative medicine. Okay, so now we concentrate our attention on the microcirculature. A microcirculature is the term defining small vessels, smaller than 0.1 millimeter in diameter. And uh, we consider microvasculature as a distinct network, as uh, all elements are united by the possibility to exchange gases. So uh, that's the definition you have to know. And microvasculature, it includes arterioles, capillaries, and postcapillary venules. So we have just discussed them. So they contain pericytes and endothelial cells, but almost no smooth muscle elements. Okay, besides, uh, one example of postcapillary venules uh, is um, high endothelial venules in the lymph nodes. Maybe you remember, they um, performed very important function in uh, tra transporting delivery of lymphocytes from the blood circulation to the lymph node. So, uh, they are very important in the extravasation of lymphocytes. Extravasation means... Uh, movement from the vessels. Vasa means vessel, extravasation, just trans transport from vessel to the tissue. And exactly in the postcapillary venules, some leukocytes by diapedesis move to the tissue, some migrate to tissue, some. And exactly here, the histamine increases permeability to cause edema. Okay, I repeat this many times. Then let's investigate elements uh, of this network and uh, we have to pay first of all attention to capillaries. Capillaries means the hair. Uh, it was thought they are as thin as hair, but actually they are much more thin. And uh, in um, this specimen we can see that the thickness of capillaries is almost the same as the diameter of the red blood cell. You can see that red blood cells are arranged like a stack of coins inside them. And the wall of capillaries is represented only by these um, flattened cells, um, by this um, simple squamous epithelium called endothelium with its basement membrane. You can see how thin the wall is, so it allows diffusion of oxygen and transport of many metabolites across the wall. So the major function is exchange of gases and many others, of course. So capillaries are divided into three groups. Um, and let's investigate them one by one. The first type um, is continuous or somatic. Uh, please remember both names because uh, they are used um, equally in literature, so you have to know both. They are called continuous because there are no gaps between endothelial cell and there are no pores in the basement membrane. So both layers are continuous. That's why they have this name. They're also called somatic because soma means body and uh, it was the body was associated in ancient times with muscles predominantly. Yeah? So this type of capillaries um, is located in muscles. That's why somatic it was called. Um, you can see that um, yeah, here the structural features are given and diameter is very close to the red blood cell. Sometimes it's even a little bit more narrow. You remember the red blood cell, it is elastic and it could squeeze them, squeeze through the capillary even if it is of smaller diameter. The diameter is so small to provide a close um, contact between the endothelium and red blood cell to minimize the distance of diffusion. Then function, the general function to exchange gases uh, in some metabolites um, and they are located uh, for every type. You should remember typical location. We can find in muscle tissues as I've already said, that's why they're called somatic. In nervous tissue, in the connective tissue, in exocrine glands. Okay, so this is one of the most widespread type. Let's move on. The second type is called fenestrated. If you look at this diagram, you can easily see the difference because um, the endothelial cells here are perforated um, and that's what we call fenestra. Fenestra means window and like wall has windows through which light passes. Uh, in the same way endothelial cells they have those pores but they are closed with diaphragms. That's why they are called not pores 
but fenestra. And another type is visceral. Visceral means um, associated with internal organs. Those capillaries are present in the intestines and internal organs were associated with the intestines, in intestine first of all. That's why visceral type, characteral for internal organs for the intestine. Okay, so let's investigate them. Uh, so they have discontinuous endothelium perforated with fenestra and continuous basal amina. So if we compare with somatic, uh, you may uh, in, understand that uh, obviously this type is more permeable. So if we need to transport some metabolites across the wall, fenestrated capillaries will be more useful in this way. Their diameter is a little bit larger and their function is not only to exchange gases, but to exchange some metabolites like nutrients and hormones. For example, in the intestine, the absorption of nutrients uh, takes place. And to facilitate this absorption, to allow more nutrients to enter the bloodstream, there are fenestrations. Okay, so fenestrations are needed to facilitate the filtration of blood in kidneys, to facilitate absorption of nutrients in intestine, and to stimulate the absorption of hormones in the endocrine glands. You remember that endocrine glands, they produce hormones to the bloodstream. So perforations, um, they're very helpful in this way. Perforations or fenestra, they are formed uh, along with the pinocytosis, along with the endocytosis or transcytosis, when vesicle is formed inside endothelial cell. And this vesicle is put between one and another membrane and suddenly it opens on both sides. So instead of transcytosis, uh, exocytosis occurs on both sides. As endothelial cell is very flattened, very thin, this vesicle forms the pore and diaphragm is formed by the glycocalyx present inside the vesicle. Okay, so the number of perforations increases when organ is activated, for example, when gland actively produces hormones, the number of fenestra increases and the number could decrease um, if the organ is not active, obviously. And the last type, continuous, discontinuous capillaries, they are also called sinusoids. Again, please remember both names. Um, maybe you remember in uh, spleen, we have already um, talked about them. Discontinuous, very easy to remember, they have both discontinuous endothelium and discontinuous basal lumina. So, they are the most permeable. They have the largest diameter among other three types, um, up to 30 micrometers, um, and uh, they are used to exchange not only gases or some metabolites, like in liver, but also they could provide exchange of blood cells, in which organs uh, it is very important. For example, in organs producing blood cells. You remember which organ produce, which organ does produce? The red bone marrow. In the red bone marrow, red blood cell is formed, and to enter bloodstream, it should cross the blood vessel wall. So exactly in the red bone marrow, sinusoids are needed. Um, and exactly there we can find them. Also in the spleen, you remember in the spleen instead, after um, checking the quality, red blood cells are returned back to the circulation through the sinusoids, exactly. And also discontinuous capillaries are there. And in the liver, where intense uh, exchange of metabolites um, uh, takes place. Also, there are great perforations in liver basement membrane could be even absent, completely absent in some places. Okay, so please remember three types of capillaries uh, and uh, remember the, uh, the correlation between the structure and functional properties. Um, then it will be very easy for you. And after that, several words about lymphatic capillaries. So we have already discussed in the lymphatic system, in the immune system, comparing with the blood capillaries, they are blind-ended. So they absorb exits of tissue fluids with all the dirty antigens um, 
and dead cells. Um, they are of very high diameter. They have anchoring fibrils, as you can see, uh, fixing them to the connective tissue elements. Um, and uh, their main function is absorption of um, yeah, different substances uh, out of the tissue. So they are used to the sewage system and they remove uh, all the rubbish, all the dirty water to the lymph nodes uh, to filtrate them. Okay, but this is not the subject of our lesson. Let's move on. And here another comparison of three types of capillaries are given. Again, compare the continuous capillaries with fenestrated and discontinuous one. On this diagram, the difference is obvious. Okay, and uh, after we have discussed capillaries, arterioles and venules, um, in microcirculatory bed, we have to mention very important uh, component, which is the anastomose um, or the shunt. Here this vessel is shown um, and the question is what is the difference between the anastomose uh, and capillary? Because they are sometimes alternatively used um, and anastomoses they provide discharge of the blood from the artery arterial to the venule without exchange of gases. So when blood moves directly from through the anastomose exchange of gases uh, doesn't occur and uh, arterial blood moves directly to venous blood why do we need those anastomoses what's the reason of having them the reason is that in many organs we have many capillaries collapsed because when organ is actively used those capillaries get opened and uh, the blood circulation becomes more intense. When we do not use this organ, capillaries collapse because uh, the activity is much more low. For example, when we are running, our muscles, they need more oxygen. So all capillaries um, get open and muscles, they receive more blood, more oxygen from the circulation. At the same time, our intestine gets less respectively. And to regulate the distribution of blood between the organs, um, we have a special regulatory systems represented by two major elements. First, smooth muscle cells in the anastomosis. Um, when anastomosis uh, contract their smooth muscle elements, blood passes through the capillary network and exchange of gases takes place there. Yeah. When this uh, anastomose relaxes its smooth muscle elements, uh, then blood moves through the anastomose, avoid, um, bypassing the capillary network. Also another regulatory, the second regulatory element is precapillary sphincters. Here they are. If sphincters get closed, then blood moves through the anastomose. When sphincters relax, blood passes through the capillary network. Uh, for example, when it is hot, we turn in red, yeah, because in cheeks, uh, more capillaries uh, get open and anastomosis at the same time, they close. And instead, when it is cold, anastomosis, um, they relax um, and blood discharges from arterial to venule uh, to avoid the heat loss in our face, in the skin. Yeah, of our cheeks. Um, so those two elements are very important in regulation and anastomoses are important not only in thermoregulation, in erectile function and uh, in many other organs. Um, so remember the function of those elements. Um, also another term you have to, we have to mention, this is the metarterial. Metarterial, exactly this is the branch um, splitting into two intercapillary network and into uh, anastomos. So Exactly here, precapillary sphincters are located, uh, and after that, um, those two mechanisms regulate the distribution of blood flow. Usually, blood flows through both systems, through the anastomose and through capillary network. But if to close anastomose, if to open capillary network, only through capillaries, like that. Okay, uh, so next. After we have discussed uh, capillaries uh, and um, the microcirculatory bed with its um, arterioles and postcapillary venules, very important in diapedesis, uh, in um, the regulation of um, 
the blood permeability or blood vessel permeability, we should discuss endothelial cells in details. They have a very important function in regulating many processes. First of all, these are the transport of different molecules across the vessel's wall. Of course, nutrients and uh, different molecules, they are selectively transported, and we are talking about selective permeability. In endothelial cells, you can see we can see lots of vesicles because some materials, they simply diffuse them through the wall like oxygen. Some small proteins, for example, they pass through the pinocytosis. Some uh, substances like low-density lipids, they are transported through the receptor-mediated endocytosis. So all types of transport are characterial for endothelial cells. Then, non-thrombogenic barrier. For, as for the surface of endothelial cell, if it is continuous and if it is healthy, then platelets do not adhere to the surface and they do not form clots. It is very important because if endothelial cells they get damaged, they provoke blood clot formation. And it is very dangerous because it might collapse the blood vessel and cause the infarction of many organs. Um, so the regulation of uh, the blood clotting is a very important function. And when vessel is damaged, endothelium participates in the platelet aggregation. The modulation of blood flow, and this is what we are going to talk in details, because in vessels, especially in small vessels and medium-sized, um, endothelium performs important function in the regulation of blood pressure by producing either vasoconstrictors to contract the blood vessel wall or vasodilators to relax, to reduce the blood pressure. Both components are very important, and as I told you, hypertension is very widespread pathology. So to understand how to correct it, we have to comprehend all the mechanisms uh, in regulating the blood pressure. Okay, then modulation of immune responses. Um, endothelial cells, they expose receptors uh, for neutrophils, for example, P-selectin. In the topic blood, we discussed uh, that neutrophils and other leukocytes, when they pass along the blood vessel's wall, they attach and they adhere to the endothelium because endothelium exposes uh, selectins on its surface. So if inflammation takes place around the capillary, around the postcapillary venule, then its endothelium exposes selectin molecules uh, attracting the neutrophils and uh, causing its attachment, the first phase of diapedesis. Also, it produces some interleukin factors uh, and many other molecules, some like uh, the nitrous oxide, uh, we'll talk later. Then synthesis of biologically active substances, for example, granulocyte, colony stimulating factor, um, many others and modification of lipoproteins and uh, this is a very important function because endothelium it exposes receptors to low density lipids um, and uh, it ingests uh, those lipids and oxidizes them and in case of atherosclerosis um, low density lipids they accumulate in high amount uh, they attract macrophages they Phagocytose, those lipids turn into foam cells and uh, then stimulate proliferation of smooth muscle elements. They cause the inflammatory reaction. So the atherosclerosis is launched in this way. So under normal circumstances, lipoproteins just oxidized here. But if low density lipoproteins are present in high amount in our bloodstream, if this fraction, this is a rather dangerous fraction, is present in increased um, percentage, then uh, endothelial cells, they can't deal with such amount and it provokes atherosclerosis. And that's what you are to investigate in um, pathological anatomy in pathology later. Okay, but uh, remember that this is the normal function of endothelial cells to deal with um, lipids and to oxidize them. Okay, and um, 
what we have to say about endothelial cells is that also they have vibrant pallidum bodies. Um, here they are of increased density. And those bodies, yeah, here they are. Yeah, uh, those bodies they contain two very important components: one stimulating the blood clot formation, and another well-known P-selectin. We have just said. Uh, it attracts neutrophils and it stimulates the neutrophils arrival to the site of the inflammation. So those bodies are inside endothelial cells and uh, they get exocytosed under the action of some um, stress stimuli. So those bodies uh, are used to stimulate the platelets aggregation and neutrophil attraction in case of inflammation anywhere around the vessel wall. So as it is um, shown here, epinephrine, thrombin, they have um, like, uh, the, they, they regulate the exocytosis of those bodies. So under normal circumstances, circumstances they present inside the cytoplasm, they get exocytosed. Um, and um, under the inflammatory reaction. Okay, let's move on. And um, in detail, some mechanisms um, are shown regulating the vasoconstriction here, vasoconstriction, and uh, relaxation, vasodilation in this way. So this is the very detailed mechanism. So you investigate only if you want to get five. Really, this is for the best student. And um, the most interesting data is that um, relaxation or vasodilation is stimulated by endothelium in case it is affected by the bradykinin, ADP, and uh, shear stress caused by the blood flow along the surface. So if this shear stress affects the endothelium or some chemicals it interact with the receptors, then vascular endothelial growth factor stimulates the endothelial and or Syn synthase. Um, this is the nitric oxide synthase. Then, as a result, L-arginine produces nitric oxide. Here, this molecule. Nitric oxide diffuses to the smooth muscle elements under the endothelium. So, here is the endothelial cell, and here is the smooth muscle element under it. So, smooth muscle cell is affected by the nitric oxide, um, it launches the cyclic GMP formation, it stimulates protein kinase G, cyclic GMP, protein kinase G, and as a result it decreases the calcium and relaxation takes place. Another pathway is uh, through the prostaglandin E2 um, synthesis, uh, and as a result, um, this prostaglandin acts on its receptors and stimulate the formation of cyclic AMP. Yeah, and then cyclic AMP stimulates protein kinase A, and uh, as a result, again, uh, relaxation takes place. Another factor is endothelial derived hyperpolarizing factor. It stimulates the potassium channels, calcium dependent potassium channels, to get opened. Uh, as a result, uh, hyperpolarization takes place um, and again relaxation. So these are teeny molecular mechanisms uh, and uh, they are important to understand uh, uh, for pharmacology because um, to relax smooth muscle cells, uh, different uh, components of this chain are affected. And the uh, opposite is um, the vasoconstriction, when blood vessels get contracted, uh, they contract in response to angiotensin 2 and thrombin, for example. As for the angiotensin 2, we are to talk in the next semester, uh, because um, this system is launched from kidneys, uh, then through lungs, through adrenal glands, and they affect blood vessels also. This is a complicated mechanism, but this um, substance uh, stimulates the production of the endothelin, prostaglandin H2, thromboxane A2, and uh, they all stimulate the increased calcium, increased calcium concentration in the smooth muscle cells and its contraction. Other way is the production of the superoxide radical. It breaks down nitric oxide, and in this way, also 
stimulates their contraction. So two opposite mechanisms uh, and the balance between the two results in the normal blood pressure. Okay, and this slide I think is very important uh, because now one of the most um, um, relevant purposes of the regenerative medicine is to know how to regenerate endothelial cells because the damage of endothelial cells results in many diseases like atherosclerosis uh, because um, after myocardial infarction it's very important not only to renew myocardial cells cardiomyocytes but also to vascularize them to regenerate blood vessels network and uh, for this purpose we need to know where to get those progenitors of endothelial cells and this is a very complicated purpose. First of all, I have to say that uh, uh, the term endothelial progenitor cell was very popular. Now it is better to use the term endothelial colony forming cells um, because um, when um, when scientists investigated uh, those endothelial progenitor cells, uh, they give this name to many cells with, um, without these possibilities. And to avoid confusions, another term was invented. And um, now the cells regenerating endothelium are called um, endothelial colony forming cells. Uh, what is shown in this diagram? The endothelial cells are blue in color, some of them are green. Green means they can proliferate and they can regenerate endothelium and they are called tissue resident endothelial colony forming cells. Also notice that there are some circulating cells with the same properties, they are light green. And there are some myeloid angiogenic cells. It was thought exactly that they are the source of endothelium, they derive from the bone marrow and they regenerate endothelium, but now it was revealed that they do not replace endothelial cells, but instead they come from the bone marrow to stimulate local endothelial cells to proliferate and to regenerate. That's what is very important. So nowadays um, we know that endothelial cells, they regenerate themselves. Um, because some of them they retain the possibility to divide but as well circulating population is present its source is unknown and uh, they are very intensely investigated right now okay so after we have discussed vessels and different types of vessels let's talk about heart very quickly and um, in brief so the heart uh, muscle we have already discussed in the previous topic uh, when we had muscle tissue so we are to concentrate on the another de details um, first of all endocardium the innermost layer it is represented by the endothelial cells like the tunica intima of blood vessels then there is a subendothelial layer of loose connective tissue again as a tunica media after that the layer of elastic fibers and smooth muscle cells uh, and then uh, again connective tissue which is also called subendocardium. Why subendocardium is so interesting? Because exactly there Parkinger fibers are located. So these are the terminals of the conductive system and uh, they are located between the endocardium and myocardium. Then the derivatives of the endocardium are the wolves. Uh, they prevent the backflow of the heart, of the blood. They are located between atriums and ventricles, or ventricles and major vessels. Um, wolves are very, very important, and they have the three surfaces. Um, first surface is called fibrosa, and it is faced uh, to the ventricle in case of atrioventricular wolves. And they are faced to arteries in case of semilunar wolves. So fibrosa is the most dense and stiff layer because exactly this is the first layer to prevent the backflow. It is faced to the highest pressure and it is represented by the dense irregular connective tissue. It forms a network of collagen type 1 and it prevents the tearing of the wolf leaflet and uh, it helps to yeah, performance function properly. Then spongiosa, this is the middle layer, sponge-like property, and here ground substance prevail. It uh, is used like a shock absorber 
during the differences of blood pressure. And uh, this is the middle layer, soft middle layer. Then atrialis or ventricularis is faced to the opposite side, so uh, opposite to fibrosum. If we are talking about uh, atrioventricular valves, then it is faced to atriums. If we are talking about the semilunar valves, then it is faced to ventricles. And uh, uh, this surface is also covered with um, smooth endothelium and uh, some connective tissue fibers are present there. Notice that here inside the wolf leaflet there are no blood vessels. No blood vessels. And if they appear, this is the problem, because it, cause, it is usually caused by inflammation and it results in the damage of the uh, wolf. Uh, there are three typical problems uh, of wolves. The first problem, when connective tissue is broken, when collagen fibers are broken or misproduced. Uh, the second problem is when collagen fibers are produced in exceed uh, and uh, overproduced, and this is what we call fibrosis. And it also makes uh, wolf leaflets rigid and um, they can't uh, deal um, with the, their function. And the third problem is the calcination, when calcium salts are formed inside. Uh, and uh, all three problems, if they are exacerbated, then um, of course the walls are replaced and in cardiac surgery this is one of the most uh, frequently used um, procedure. And uh, what is interesting is that mesenchymal tissue of this wolf derives not only from endocardium, but also from the neural crest. So migration of the neural crest is very important in formation of those wolves in cardiac septation. And also neural crest cells, they populate the wolf leaflets. Um, okay, next. So if to summarize the endocardium information, let's look at the specimen. So it is represented by the endothelium with its connective tissue, subendothelial layer, then a layer of elastic fibers and smooth muscle cells and subendocardium, which is uh, frequently occupied by Parkinje fibers. And then we have the myocardium. So Parkinje are located between the endocardium and myocardium. As for the myocardium, you know almost everything, but not all. Last lecture we have discussed contractile cardiomyocytes in details. You remember about intercalated discs um, and um, all the organelles. Um, now we pay attention to the conductive and secretory. Two more types are there. You know that heart is an autonomic organ and if we extract it out of the body it continues uh, contraction for a long period of time. And um, that's because inside the heart there is a conductive system generating impulses itself. So with the help of sympathetic or parasympathetic impulses, we could um, increase or decrease the frequency, but we do not stimulate the contraction. And um, conductive cardiomyocytes, they are divided into two groups like pacemaker cells, nodal cells generating impulses, uh, and uh, also Parkinger fibers conducting the nerve impulses. Uh, as uh, for the pacemaker cells, they have two mechanisms, uh, one in their membrane and another in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They are called M clock and calcium clock. And combination of those two results in the proper heartbeat rate. So the pacemaker cells, they generate the pace, as it's obvious from the name, and uh, the frequency of heart contraction results in the frequency of their membrane depolarization. So the mechanism is very complicated and if you are interested in details I'll put the hyperlink uh, in the description below, but uh, not for students I think. <laughs> yeah, and um, as for the secretory cardiomyocytes, uh, predominantly in the atrium, in the left atrium, there are granules with electron dense material inside them containing different components like atrial natriuretic peptide. Um, many other factors also are present. Uh, so when atrial wall is overextended, uh, those um, components are discharged uh, and they cause um, 
urination urination i mean uh, the um, increases uh, the um, urine formation to decrease the blood volume so if uh, atrial wall they feel too much blood inside they stimulate uh, water loss through kidneys to decrease the volume of the blood in this way that's why it is called uretic because it stimulates the urine diuresis Okay, and now let's talk about the um, conductive system. I skip uh, the contractile cardiomyocytes, intercalated discs, you already know about them. So uh, let's compare contractile and conductive cardiomyocytes. Um, these are the criterion for you to remember. This is a very um, helpful diagram. Uh, looking at this, you can easily see the differences. So obviously, conducting cardiomyocytes, they have fewer myofibrils located at the periphery. They are much larger. They have pale cytoplasm, of course, they have less myofibrils. And they have a high glycogen content, so they are protected from the um, uh, oxygen deficiency. Yes, so they use, they might uh, break down glycogen and use the energy of glycolysis. And uh, they have um, uh, no endoplasmic reticulum and T system. So, they do not participate, they have a typical structure. Okay, so Parkinger fibers are very well example. Notice its size uh, comparing with the size uh, of them. It's not very well seen the border, but the size is much larger and the cytoplasm is more pale. Okay, and conductance system, it uh, is represented, that's what you have to know for 100%. The, sinoatrial node, sinoatrial node, the first to generate impulses, then the AV node, atrioventricular node, then bundle of his, it has uh, two branches, left and right, uh, and left uh, branch has more legs because left ventricle is uh, larger than the right, um, and terminals are called Parkinger fibers, that's what we have just discussed, Parkinger fibers, they conduct impulses to the contractile cardiomyocytes, um, Contractile cardiomyocytes are united by gap junctions. That's why they um, concomitantly can contract, um, producing the effective um, pumping, resulting in the effective pumping of the blood. Okay, and at last we are to discuss the epicardium. The outermost layer is represented by the simple squamous epithelium and subepicardial connective tissue with blood vessels. So epicardial layer, it appeared um, relatively late in evolution and its appearance is connected with the blood vessels. Uh, uh, so to increase the thickness of the myocardium, we had to provide additional nourishment not only from the lumen, yeah, but from outside. So um, the coronary vessels appeared and they were brought by the epicardium. Epicardium function is to deliver the coronary vessels. Um, then um, its uh, surface is smooth and face to pericardial cavity. So the pericardial cavity is uh, filled with fluid uh, to prevent, to reduce the friction along with the pumping of the blood. And at the last slide, the most last slide, I put the information about the heart development. Actually, the heart development, it deserves a distant lecture because heart is the organ with the most complicated development. Just believe me, heart uh, is not so uh, difficult. It, it, it has not such a difficult structure, but very difficult embryonic development. And um, it is the subject of anatomy. But as for the histology, it is important for you to understand the source and derivatives of every distant population of cells. Because uh, in regenerative medicine, which is very actively developing, it is very important to understand the endogenous potential of every organ. Let's look at it. So endocardium and myocardium, they develop from the visceral layer of lateral plate mesoderm, which is also called splanchna pleura. You remember that uh, in the gastrulation topic we discussed where it is located. Then epicardium, very interesting, it derives from the same layer of the mesoderm, but later and from another place. So it develops uh, from the transient embryonic structure, which is called proepicardium, and it is located on the surface of the septum transversum, the future diaphragm. And um, epicardium, 
when it covers the heart. It is used like a bridge to connect septum transversum with the heart. And through this bridge, blood vessels, they grow in the heart from the vena cava inferior, from the venous sinusum. So the coronary vessels, they appear as the outgrowth of the vein. And later on, they enter aorta. It is very important uh, in understanding how blood vessels appear. So the major source of coronary vessels is the vein, is the venous sinus. And it is very interesting because uh, venous um, saphena magna, uh, subcutaneous vein, is used to provide the um, bypass in the coronary, uh, in the surgery, you know, uh, the coronary vessels are usually replaced with a special bypass which are produced from the venous vessel. And as an embryonic period, um, arteries appear from veins. It is uh, reasonable to use veins to replace arteries because with time they also transform into arteries like that. But actually now synthetic materials are also used um, uh, for these purposes. Then coronary vessel endothelium. It derives uh, from the sinus venosa, that's what I've just said, um, and minimally from endocardium. Then smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts and adipocytes, they derive from the pro-epicardium, from the epicardium in other words. Okay, and wolf mesenchymal cells, mesenchymal cells, we have already said, derive from neural crest and endocardium. Not only endocardium, but neural crest cells. What is the practical application of this information? The practical application is very important. After myocardial infarction, if we want to boost the regeneration of myocardium, and if we want to vascularize it, we have to stimulate cardiomyocyte formation and endothelial cell formation. And it was revealed that um, it is possible only by stimulating cardiomyocytes to proliferate and endothelial cells to proliferate. Because any mesenchymal stem cells, any other external cells, they can't transdifferentiate into cardiomyocytes or endothelial cells. So it is very interesting and important to take into account natural mechanism, embryonic development, and uh, the natural regeneration of the myocardium of the heart to understand how to um, treat this pathology. So if under natural circumstances cardiomyocytes or endothelial cells they do not derive from other sources, there is no reason to use another sources to uh, stimulate their regeneration. So only we have to boost endothelial cells to proliferate and cardiomyocytes to proliferate. Some mesenchymal stromal cells are also used, uh, but uh, it was shown that they themselves do not incorporate into myocardium or endothelium, but instead they produce factors stimulating myocardial proliferation or endothelial pro proliferation. So mesenchymal stromal cells, besides they are used, uh, and even in clinical trials in humans, uh, after myocardial infarction, they are injected in the zone of myocardial infarction or through the bloodstream. They even show their positive effects, uh, but themselves, they do not incorporate. That's what you have to know. Okay, so a lot of information for today. Thank you for the attention. If you do like our videos, please put your thumbs up and subscribe our channel. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.